whereas Greek plays largely exist to propagate a narrative in favor of the state. Medieval plays were far more interested in promoting the moral and social behaviors of its authors. Beginning with Greek theater, a very consistent motif found is the conflict of man versus fate. In Agamemnon, fate often comes in the form of divine intervention. Greek drama, as a form of propaganda, seeks to glorify itself as well as its heroes. The play begins with a Greek victory in war at the hands of Agamemnon. Although he receives some criticism due to how costly the fighting has been from the chorus, a theme of fate exists as a convenient excuse to explain all of the losses. Can Agamemnon truly be held responsible? After all, we see how Artemis forces the sacrifice of his daughter, Iphigenia. That was unjust, but had to be done. Perhaps the Trojan War, no, any war waged by the Greek state, is out of mortal hands to control. Agamemnon intentionally refuses to walk across Clytemestra's carpet, saying it would be hubris for a mortal to do so. This line served to cement Agamemnon as an Aristotelian, kind of tragic hero, a man who is otherwise perfect besides for his singular flaw, which the audience must witness and learn from. In Agamemnon's flaw, being his hubris, the state is demonstrating what may happen to someone who places themselves on the same level as gods, or, in another sense, an excuse for why the state cannot just ignore fate. Oedipus is much the same. Its grand tale serves to ask the question of whether man truly has independence and free will. A narrative that serves as both an excuse as well as a warning to fall in line. The disastrous plague mentioned in Oedipus is reminiscent of the real-life epidemic that hit Thebes. The play asserts the plague was simply a tragic turn of fate as opposed to a governmental failing. Oedipus's fate grows grimmer the more he attempts to fight it, pushing the idea that it is best to simply go along with fate and accept what happens to you. Of course, the people highest up, the government, are the ones who decide the fate of the masses. Finally, in regards to Greek theater, the less than favorable portrayal of women in the play mirrors the patriarchal society of ancient Greece. Take Clytemestra and Agamemnon. While someone today may view her as sympathetic, independent, and justifiably angry after the death of her daughter, she was viewed decisively as a villain at the time of the play's writing. All of her better traits, her intelligence, her sense of agency, her resolve, are all traits the story assigns as masculine features. Conversely, Cassandra, a character with virtually zero agency or power, a literal slave, is held up as a tragic victim and womanhood incarnate. Now then, comparatively, let's take a look at medieval drama. The authors of medieval plays often sought to promote moral ideas, usually having to do with Christian principles. On the surface, this may seem fairly similar to Greece's propaganda for the state, while may think medieval theater is just propaganda for the church. However, I would argue that while these plays may have been to the benefit of the church, Morality plays as a whole are more a reflection of the authors themselves. Every man, despite being the go-to when discussing medieval morality plays, barely fits into the medieval era. It's believed it was written sometime during the late 1600s. For reference, the Protestant Reformation took place throughout the 1500s. Every man is also notably influenced by Protestant thought. Its message promotes the idea that all one can take into the afterlife is their deeds, 
not a message the Catholic Church would have endorsed as they greatly downplayed individual actions in regards to getting into heaven. Similarly, Martyrdom of the Holy Virgins is a convent play with a message I would argue is quite personal, as opposed to being a promotion of the Catholic Church or any other existing power structure. The author of the play, Herosid of Gandersheim, was known to preface her work with self-deprecating remarks so as to fully credit God for everything. This is despite her incredible talent that legitimately confused scholars who were trying to date her work. The play depicts women as powerful, at least under the context of the medieval era. The three sister martyrs are shown resisting powerful male rulers, performing miracles, and even ascending to heaven. As a canonist staying at an abbey, martyrdom of the holy virgins would likely have been performed for and by women. Similar to the situation with every man, it appears unlikely that Herosophit's plays would have directly benefited any existing power structure. So then, if medieval plays were so less steeped in propaganda and state support, why is that exactly? Well, first, I think it has to do a lot with the setting. Ancient Greece is a single location, sure, with many individual city-states, but still a single location. This allows nationalistic fervor to take over in a way that just doesn't happen when you're discussing the entire continent of Europe, like in a medieval morality play setting. Secondly, I believe the Christian nature of the plays also plays a significant role in this. The Christian martyr is a powerful image and one that is still romanticized today. As can be observed in Martyrdom of the Holy Virgins, part of being a martyr is going against authority and those in charge. A Greek hero, an Aristotelian hero, is a man, a weapon, a tool, and a citizen of the state. A Christian hero could be a woman or a man, and often fought against kings and governments.